today I'm going to talk about Fatal Vision. Fatal Vision is a book that was turned into a mini series in the 80s, but essentially it's about the murders of a family supposedly committed by Jeffrey McDonald. Uh, this happened February 16th, 17th uh, time frame, 1970 in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fort Bragg. So, I have to admit that I read the book Fatal Vision in my early 20s. I might have even been a teenager at the time. It was the first book, and this sticks out to me, it was the first book that had me flip-flopping all the way through of saying he was guilty he's not guilty he's guilty to ultimately I think I landed on a decision back then that kind of stuck with me until even today however uh, it's a case that's always intrigued me so I wanted to dive back into it now you know 30 years later 40 years later whatever it is um, and apply my knowledge and experiences of cold cases that I have now, which I didn't have then. Back then I just had my natural curiosity. I still have that. But on top of that, you know, I have a lot of training and experience on cold cases. And I guess very surprising to me, I dug pretty deep into this. Uh, I watched a documentary, very good one, on FX. You know how I talk about doc these true crime documentaries being, well... Uh, biased you can see they're steered one way or another paradise lost example really geared towards uh, the innocence of the West Memphis uh, three uh, what's another one another Joe Berlinger he seems to be coming up with that Lisa Lamb I think but that was more drawing it out because that was a real simple case to me um but anyhow it seems like they're geared one way or the other this one was not okay i thought it was i thought it was certainly geared to be mcdonald's innocence but the more i watch it i see that it was very neutral very um and it did a good job a great job as a matter of fact I would put that in the easily the top 10 maybe top 5 true crime documentary series that I watched on FX it was called the error uh, uh, abundance of errors I believe or something it was by Earl Errol Morris he had wrote the book and it got adapted wilderness of errors it got adapted to a five or six episode series which I did pay for to watch which was well worth my money compared to the last one that I bought on Amazon Prime that I haven't put the video out quite yet and I, uh, anyhow I don't want to digress I want to stay focused on Jeffrey McDonald okay what's the first thing we're gonna look at in any case that we look at cold cases victimology you know the background I think I explained that pretty good. Um, let's go through the timeline of the background so we know what's going on. Okay, February 16th, February 17th, the evening going into early morning hours. Um, Jeffrey McDonald's wife, his five-year-old and his two-year-old daughter were murdered. They were bludgeoned to death and they were stabbed to death. He was injured. He was alive, which is great because now you have somebody that can tell the story. Well, what happened? So they interview Mr. McDonald various times there at the scene. This and that. He has some injuries. Okay, he has a like a bruise on it and on his head. He has a stab wound in between a rib that collapsed the lung. He has a scratch from his shoulder down here. Um. Not really significant compared to the rest of his family. However, he has injuries nonetheless. He states that he was sleeping on the couch. 
He heard his wife scream, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? And he heard his daughter scream, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. He sits up, kind of in a daze. He was asleep on the couch, don't know what's going on. And he sees these intruders in front of him. Uh, at least three males. One was a black male, two uh, Caucasians, and a white female. White female has a floppy hat on, and she has a candle, and she's chanting, Acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Uh, he starts to get up, and he's clubbed in the head, and he starts fighting, and somehow his pajama top gets pulled over his head, and now it is in his tied on his wrist. He sees a glimmer of a knife. Somebody is trying to stab him. He's parrying the blows with this shirt. And next thing he knows, he wakes up in the hallway. When he wakes up in the hallway, he's having a hard time breathing. He goes to his wife. She sees that she's dead. Goes to his kids, see that they're dead. And he calls for help. That's the crux of his story. Now, the timeline for this is this. Those murders happen. And that was in February 1970. In October of 70, he is brought before the army to be court martialed. He is arrested for these charges. They don't believe him, okay? However, the army dismisses all those charges and gives him an honorable discharge. They say there is no evidence that Captain McDonald, he was a Green Beret doctor, committed these crimes. Now, his in-laws, Mildred and Freddie Kassab, so his wife Colette, his parents, Loved him, okay? But at some point in time, they felt his story wasn't lining up. And I'll get into that when we go through victimology. But I'm just giving you a timeline, a quick timeline of what's going on. So, in 1974, the victim, Colette's parents, flip-flop and now are against Jeff McDonald and believe that he did these murders. So, someone's backing up out there. I hear a beep. I'm always paranoid about that stuff. I'm paranoid anyhow. But when I hear things, I got to check it out. And I won't edit this out because I do everything live. So, in 19, or 1974, when Colette's parents... They, they start, especially Freddy Kassab, he starts pushing, writing letters, going to congressmen, saying, hey, he's getting away with murder of my daughter, is actually his stepdaughter, but we need to do something about this. He takes it and he files a federal petition, and I didn't even know there was such a thing. Like, I know there's private criminal complaints. What that is, is let's say you feel the police are not doing their job. You have the right to go to the district attorney's office and say, hey, I want to file a private criminal complaint against so-and-so for harassment. I called the police and they're not doing their job. I used to get those complaints all the time. They go to the district attorney. District attorney would give them to his detective and figure out, hey, is there enough here? Yes. Okay. You can. The district attorney has to approve it. I didn't know there was such a thing in federal court. Now, even though I worked for the FBI for two years and did a lot of stuff in the federal court system, I did not know this existed. So he petitioned a federal court. Finally, they agreed. And they convened a grand jury in 1975. And they indict Jeffrey McDonald for these murders. Through some legal appeals, he is able to stay out of jail from 75 to 1979. Where he is tried and convicted of these murders. <coughs> Excuse me. Now he gets out. For a couple months, maybe even a year, based on some legal stuff, uh, he didn't get a speedy trial, so they released him. Court overruled that. He went back in in 1982, and he's been there since. However, 
Is he guilty? We all know, and if you don't know, I'm going to be the first to tell you, I guess, there are innocent people in jail. It's the way it is. And anyone that says that there's not, they're, they're very naive. But is Jeffrey McDonald one of them? Well, guess what? I'm here to tell you because I look deep into this. So, victimology. I said we're going to get into this. This is very important. What type of people are these? Jeffrey McDonald, All-American, captain of his co-captain of his high school football team, high school uh, ba baseball team. He was a star athlete. Went to Princeton Medical School. An officer in the army. Very good looking, very athletic, very charismatic. All-American boy. His sweetheart, Colette Stevenson. He meets her at age 14. Her parents love him. They get married at like 19. I have two kids. At the time of this murder, they were both, I believe, 26 years old. So about 12 years they've known each other. Probably been married about seven years. I could be wrong on that. Again, I preface this by telling you, I'm not an expert on this case. So if I leave something out, or miss an age by saying they were 26 when they were 27. It doesn't take away from the totality of everything that I'm trying to show you. Keep that in mind. Also, victimology. Colette. What did I learn from Colette's background? Typical 50s marriage, right? Where she's the housewife. He's the breadwinner. She does the cooking, the cleaning, this and that. But it seemed like she was, she had her own opinions about things and she wasn't afraid to say it. An example is a neighbor one time heard her blow up at Jeff for buying a new TV. She admitted that she blew up at him, you know, so she wasn't afraid to get in his face. That's important here. Remember that. She wasn't, you know, somebody that would cower down it doesn't appear to me if she felt she was right she was going to state it she was pregnant at the time of those murders four months pregnant who's that sound like we just did a video well, not too long ago Scott Peterson two girls Kimberly age five, and Kristen, age two. Victims. It's hard to do victimology on young kids like that because they haven't had time to develop into something that you can gravitate to and say they had their own opinions. They were like this. Even though at those ages, you do. You do have your own. You're starting maybe to develop your personality, but it's not there yet. However, what I did learn from reading the Criminal Investigation Division of the Army's reports, which is very thorough, is that both girls had bedwetting problems. This, I believe, is going to come into play significantly in these murders. Now, in those reports... There was a witness. Colette was taking some sort of class, college class at night, and she would interact. One of these classes is about like child development and, and life and like a home ec type of thing. She brought up to the class about bedwetting. And when the child would come into their bed in bed wet how Jeff would allow her to stay there and make Colette go sleep on the couch okay everybody in this class disagreed with that and they stated the daughter her daughter's should be made to go back to their their bed. 
This was like a sigh of relief to Colette. Like she agreed with this. One person I think actually noted she was shaking her head. Yes. Very significant. Okay. So that's about it on victimology. Right? All American family. Two kids. They are living on base in a one floor apartment that is connected to others. So it's not a secluded area. Three bedrooms and a utility room in a living room and a kitchen. Three bedrooms is significant. You have the parents' bedroom and you have Kimberly's bedroom, the five-year-old, and Kristen's, the two-year-old's. Now, let's get into witnesses, okay? As you know, in any murder investigation, any homicide, a neighborhood canvas should be done. Talk to neighbors, talk to teachers, all that stuff. Well, that was done here very well. One of the neighbors, you can imagine that you're not talking yards apart. You're talking connected buildings. So it's very possible and probable that neighbors would have heard something. And in fact, one of them did. One of them said they heard a woman scream. And she also heard, you have two different witnesses. One heard a neighbor scream and another one said she heard a woman say something she said, I don't know the exact words, but it was a rhetorical type of response from a female, like, what the hell are you doing? Something to that effect. Very late at night, another neighbor said her dog started barking three o'clock in the morning, which was unusual. Much like the O.J. Simpson case, where the Akita of Nicole's I think it was an Akita, could have the dog type wrong, started barking. So you know when these murders occur. Anybody have dogs? When they start barking, something's wrong. Okay? So these murders more than likely took place around 3 o'clock in the morning. That is significant as well. And I'll get into why. So now we know that something has taken place inside that house, that apartment, around three o'clock in the morning. This comes down to, much like John Benet Ramsey case, right? This is gonna come down to intruder inside the house. It's gotta be one or the other, can't be both. So it's our job to deduce that to figure out which one is. I have done that. You know why? Because that's what I do. I'm going to explain to you in a very meticulous and hopefully articulate fashion as to how I come to my conclusion. Just like in John Benet Ramsey, just like in any case, any case, you have two sides of the story and you have the groupies over here that believe they're innocent. You have the groupies over here that say they're guilty. I will tell you which one, what groupie I am at the end of this. Evidence. What evidence is in this case? A lot. Okay. Fibers. Fibers play the most crucial role in this case. To me, blood drops. Very unique in this case. Four people in that house. If you count the intruders, eight. We don't know anything about the blood types of these intruders. But we do know that the four blood types of everyone in that apartment are different. You have an AB, you have an O so on and so forth, they're all different, which makes tracking that blood in that house relatively simple. Thank goodness. 
It tells a story, folks. The murder weapons. This is the second most significant. Let me think about that. No, I'm going to move that up to number one. Fibers are going to go down to number two. These murder weapons are found. Okay. An ice pick. The wounds are... When these victims came from an ice pick, a paring knife, and a club, all three of those weapons are found outside the back door of this residence. What does that tell you? Well, we'll get into that. Intruders. There is a hair in the right hand, I believe, of Carl Letts that the defense says is from an intruder. There is a blonde synthetic hair found in the residence. This supports his claim that a blonde girl in a floppy hat was in the house. Now, how does that support? Well, it is brought forth that the blonde-haired girl was wearing a wig. The blonde-haired girl is eventually identified as a woman named Helena Stokely. Helena Stokely was known by the Fayetteville Police Department as a drug abuser. When McDonald gives his account that a blonde girl chanting acid is groovy was standing there while his family's getting butchered and he's getting beat up with a candle, she's wearing a floppy hat. That goes out to the police. The police re take this in. One of the police on the way there, I believe his, came, his name it was a military policeman, Ken Micah, says, I passed a girl on the way here. 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, okay? Odd time to be out. The weather, it's rainy, it's cold, but he sees this girl. He doesn't pay no attention other than it catches his eye. That's Helena Stokely. Not so fast, my friends. If you listen to Ken Micah, he will tell you that was not Helena Stokely because he knows Helena Stokely and that wasn't her. That was some other girl standing out by the PX, blah, blah, blah. So disregard that. Is there any other evidence... To support an intruder. Blonde wig hair? Yes. Unidentified hair in Colette's hand? Yes. Other than that, I didn't see any. Possibly there was the finger part of a blonde or a surgical glove, bloody, that was found in the bedroom. What's the significance of that? We don't know. Could come from an intruder. The crime scene. Let's get into that a little bit. Now that you know the evidence, let's look at the crime scene. You have three different, four different locations. You have the master bedroom, where Colette's body is laid on the floor, on her back. Multiple stab wounds to her neck, to her chest. Her head has been beaten in with a club. Kimberly's bedroom, her head has been bashed. She has stab wounds and she is tucked in to bed, like laying on her side. Kristen, the two-year-old, is in her bed with a bottle laying in front of her face, but her head is bleeding from like 24 stab wounds. 
to the chest, and to the back. Let's go back now to the blood drops. Blood drops are where they, you would think that they should be for the most part. Kristen's blood, the two-year-old in the bed, is bleeding, still dripping from her wounds off of the bed onto the floor when the MPs get there. So that tells you she hasn't been dead for long. But also, in Kristen's room, is a significant amount of spatter that is identified as Carlette's. A significant amount not a trace amount okay remember that when we get to our deductions Kimberly's room you have Kimberly's blood as well as should be now where else do you think that blood should be I've given you three out of the four well who else has injuries Jeffrey McDonald. Remember, he has a contusion to his head. He has a stab wound, some puncture wounds. But where did this occur at? According to him, if you remember, he's asleep on the couch. He gets up. He's attacked with a knife, with a club in the living room. Guess what? No Jeffrey McDonald blood in the living room. The living room does show signs of a struggle. The coffee table with magazines are flipped up. The coffee table is laying on its side with magazines under it. Now, the prosecution believes this was staged. Why? According to them, they went and tested flipping that table over. And every time, say this is the table, it would not land on its side. It would go completely over. Every time. They surmised it was staged. However, there's a chair there. If it flipped over and hit that chair, it's going to stay on its side. In addition, why well, I don't buy the prosecution's theory on this is if there was three or four people in that room and there's a struggle and that table gets flipped over what's to say it didn't hit somebody and stop its momentum from going over so do I believe that it was staged maybe maybe not but what I do know is that I don't buy the, the theory that it would never land on its side. Okay. No other room in the house seemed to be disturbed. There were supposed cards, knickknacks and stuff. Uh, there was a lamp right beside the couch where he said he was attacked. None of that was knocked over. So what? If you go into the bedroom where Colette is murdered, you also see there was obviously a disturbance there. Nothing else is knocked over in there. So you can't rely too much on that strictly. Just because things aren't knocked over doesn't mean, you know, that... A struggle did or did not take place. So, we have to determine whether it was an intruder or, or somebody inside the house. If it's from inside the house, it's not like the John Bonet where you have three people inside the house and you have to determine which one it was, or if it was all three, or if it was two. Here, three are dead, one's alive. You know, 
you don't need me to deduce that it's either an intruder or it's Jeffrey McDonald, okay? Let me tell you how I've come to my conclusion of how I determine whether it was an intruder or not. Number one, the hair in Carlette's hand. In 2014, I believe, I may have that wrong, in the 2000s, that hair was a test was tested and it wasn't an intruder's hair as the defense claimed. You know whose it was? You guessed it. It was Jeffrey McDonald's. DNA confirmed. Still doesn't mean he did it, right? I mean, just because it's in her bloody clenched hand doesn't mean that he's guilty. But let me tell you why he is guilty. We talked before about crimes of opportunity and weapons of opportunity. For the most part, if you go to a place to commit a crime, you take a weapon with you. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes, as in serial killings, you will see sometimes just strangulation, manual. Not all the time. But I, when I think of that, I think of the Green River Killer. Killing prostitutes and strangling them. It's different. Most of them are getting in your car in your controlled environment. Who's to say you don't have a backup weapon in case something goes south? In this case, Jeffrey McDonald wants you to believe that four hippies came into his house with no weapons. You know why? All of the murder weapons came from inside that house. That's the most significant piece of evidence you need to hear. Paring knife. Club. The club is crucial. And I'll tell you why in a minute. In the ice pick. Now, Jeffrey McDonald's supporters will say, you cannot conclusively say that the paring knife nor the ice pick came from his house. Well, you have witnesses that say he said he had an ice pick when I was there and I was trying to break off the ice with my hands. Jeffrey McDonald went and got an ice pick. To me, that concludes that he had an ice pick in the house. As for a paring knife, there was there was a different type of knife that was found in the master bedroom that had a bent blade on it. That's significant because one of the babysitters for the McDonald's remembers that specific knife because of the bent blade. Now that specific knife is not the knife used in the stabbings. It was a paring knife. But yet don't you find it ironic that that bent knife is found at the crime scene along with a paring knife. So let's just, just for shits and giggles, let's throw out that paring knife and say, okay, well, the paring knife, we can't conclusively say came from the McDonald's. Four hippies are coming into this house with one paring knife. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Now you're going to say, well, what's to say that the hippies didn't go in the kitchen and grab a paring knife? I'm not saying they couldn't. But the possibility, yes. But the probability of that is nil. It's nil. That paring knife came from inside the house. Just like the ice pick and just like the club. Now, how do we know that the club came from inside the house? This is very significant, okay? Joan Jett and the Runaways, you're going to be proud of this one. All right, listen. Introduced at trial is the club. The club is found out back, okay? Feet from the back door with the paring knife, which is found under a bush with the ice pick. Everything's out there. First of all, if an intruder brings a weapon, 
he's leaving with that weapon. Okay? And he's not discarding it out the back. Period. This club was 31 inches long. And it was used to balance the bottom of the bed in the master bedroom. Now, how do we know that? There is paint on the bed that corresponds with that club, that piece of wood, that match up identical. Identical, okay? There, there is zero doubt. Zero doubt in my mind that, that club, that piece of wood, came from underneath the master bedroom that the bed was sitting on. Okay, let's say this is the club. Okay, this is the, the foot of the bed and it rests on it to balance it out because for some reason it was broke and he had stuck this piece of wood. And when they painted it, when you removed it, when you removed the club or the you removed the bed, there was imprints of paint that matched up perfectly. Now, now this gets interesting, okay? So now what can we deduce other than, okay, the weapons came from inside the house. Not only that, let's just talk about the club. The club underneath the foot of the bed. Who knows that that's there? I goddamn guarantee you, hippies, intruders, don't know that that weapon is there. It's it's not like a gun underneath a bed. It's a, it's a piece of wood, 31 inches. Okay? Now, Colette knows it's there. Jeffrey knows it's there. But do they know it's a weapon? No, they're not thinking that. But let me tell you what went down to make one of them think that it was a weapon. Let's go back to the time that this occurred. Three o'clock in the morning. A significant event had to happen at three o'clock in the morning. For this to occur. Intruders coming into an unlocked house? Yes, that would be a significant event. Front door was locked by all accounts. Back door, not sure. When the MPs got there, the back door was not locked. Could that have been from Jeffrey McDonald opening up the back door and throwing those weapons out? Yes, possible. We're not there yet. But something happened at 3 o'clock in the morning. And let me tell you what I think happened. Now, again, I always tell you I don't like to speculate on cases, especially active cases. And I don't on active cases. This ain't an active case, folks. This guy's been in jail for 50 years. I'm going to tell you my theory. Well, I know. Get excited because I'm finally going to tell you something and not say and be wishy-washy on it. Well, I am going to be a little wishy-washy on some of the things. Kimberly, the five-year-old daughter. Let me back up. Let's go back to Jeffrey's timeline when he says what happened. He says Colette went to bed that night at 11.30. Okay, I'm going to buy that. He says he stays up, he's reading a book, blah, blah, blah. Two o'clock in the morning, he does the dishes. Don't know. But at 2.30 a.m., okay, now we're getting close to the murder time, right? 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. At 2.30, he goes to bed. He finds that Kristen, the two-year-old, has wet his bed. He gets her up, he takes her back to her room. Remember, this is not what he normally do, did, according to Colette, what she told her class. But he takes her back to her room, gives her a bottle, 
he goes and sleeps on the couch. And that's when chaos ensued. So we can narrow down everything. I think he's telling the truth, you know, up till 2.30 in the morning. When he goes to bed, he had just worked a 24-hour shift at the hospital. According to the CID reports, a 24-hour shift. He had taken a nap, but he had worked a 24-hour shift. Very important. After he finishes reading and doing dishes, I don't know if I buy that one, but we'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt so far. He then goes into his room. And I believe that Kimberly was in his bed, not Kristen. And Kimberly wet the bed. Now, why is he saying Kristen? Well, because I believe that he's distancing himself from the reason that this murder took place. Kimberly is five. She also had a bedwetting issue. Now, whether this issue was cured or not is unknown. However, what leads me to believe this is that Kimberly's blood is found in that master bedroom. Not a trace amount. Good six inch puddle of it. Now I'm not saying that he. Lashed out at the child. And started beating her because of this. I'm not saying that. But listen to what I think. Probably took place. Now remember back. When I said about the fibers. Being the most important. And then I flopped that. He had a pajama top on. When Army investigators searched that house, they got down with a magnifying glass, looked all over the carpets. Jeffrey McDonald says he got into this big scuffle with all these people in the living room, upturned the coffee table. He's getting stabbed. He's blocking the stabbing with his Shirt top that got pulled up over, okay? Wouldn't you expect to find fibers out there? Remember we said, shouldn't we find blood? We didn't find no blood. We're going to find fibers from this violent fight, right? No. Not one fiber in that living room. Guess where the majority... Of those fibers are found. Gina, you got it. In the master bedroom. So what does that tell you? Yes. There was a struggle in the master bedroom. Now. What happened? It's my belief. That Kimberly, not Kristen was in his bed when he went to go to bed after working the 24-hour shift. He's tired, wants to go to bed. He goes to get in it. She wet the bed. Kristen, I think he would have a little bit more slack with. She's two. Kimberly, come on. You're five. We corrected this. Now I'm angry. Colette wakes up. Some sort of, I'm not a psychic. I don't believe in psychics. I've told you that. I'm not even a psychic going to be able to tell you this. Something transpired right there between Colette and Jeffrey McDonald. This is a domestic disturbance homicide. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. They get into a fight. Now, how does it come about? It is coming about because of the bedwetting, but how does it turn to murder? Well, the argument takes place. A neighbor hears the argument. Dogs start barking. Somehow, this turns violent. And we know this from all the fibers 
the torn pocket of Jeffrey McDonald's pajama top is located in that bedroom. Those fibers from his shirt getting ripped are found underneath Colette's body. Are you with me so far? Because let me tell you now how the weapons get introduced. More specifically, the club. Okay, when I was thinking about this and doing my research, I could not I could not come to grips as to okay, I knew it was him. You know, you go in with an open mind. Could be an intruder, but the evidence, everything, totality of everything got me to rule out the intruder. Now it's him. Okay, that was fairly easy. What is difficult is why and how the urine stain, from what I researched, and I couldn't find it the second time I went back in to look for it, but it stuck out to me that it said that it could not have come from Kristen, but it couldn't be ruled to anybody else. So that backed up my theory that it was Kimberly. Now, why do I think it was Kimberly? Because... Her blood being in that bedroom, okay, that's significant. She was awake, unlike Kristen, who was asleep in bed. Kimberly was awake. How does she get awake? She either gets awake because of the argument between Jeffrey and Colette, or she's involved in the argument, which I, I don't necessarily believe. She was in that bed, I believe. She peed the bed. This started the argument. He's tired. 24-hour shift. Back to the club. So Colette and him get into this argument. How it escalates to a physical fight, I don't know, but it does. He pushes her. At some point, he punches her, whatever it is. He pushes her against that bed. And that bed, remember the, the club? You know, the bed being on top of the club? When he pushes her against that bed, or she falls down, it dislodges that. She stands up. He punches her. She falls down. When she's laying on that ground, facing that bed, what does she see? A weapon of opportunity. He doesn't see that, because he's not on the ground. In his mind, if he's fighting with her, he is not going to be like, oh yeah, I got this wooden club here. Let me hit her with it. No way. No way that happens. She introduces it. She introduces it as a weapon of opportunity. She got punched in the face. That is Bohr's evidence in the autopsy report. When she's laying down on the ground, she comes up with that club to defend herself. All that does is enrage him more. And now it turns from a very physical domestic disturbance to murder. Because he grabs that club from her and he smacks her with it. Right across the head. And she drops. Now, does he turn and hit his daughter Kimberly who is probably trying to get in between them to stop it? Yes. Now the prosecution, I believe, will say he hit her accidentally. I don't believe that because of the, the force of that injury cr crushing her skull, busting her nose enough that it goes to one side. That's not an accident. Okay? That's on purpose. He hits her with it. She falls right there next to her mom. That's how her blood gets on the carpet in the master bedroom. Now, how does the other weapons get introduced? Well, I would surmise that he goes and gets the knife. He introduces those weapons. Now, why does he do that? He's still blinded by rage, okay? But he realizes 
what he's done. He starts to concoct a plan of cover-up. Now, th did he hit Colette more than once? Yes. She's probably laying there, more than likely unconscious from her wounds. Kimberly, it only took one hit. Okay? He starts freaking out, thinking, what have I done? I got to cover this up. So how does he cover it up? He takes Kimberly... Carries her back to her bed. Puts her there. He starts maybe putting those injuries, those self-inflicted injuries to himself. Now, the one on his head. I believe Colette did that. I believe she got a shot in on that club on him. Not enough to break the skin. Not enough to cause bleeding. But enough where it, it triggered him. Where he took that club from her and then he beat her to death. But she what she didn't die right away. She was just she was unconscious. And how do we know that? Well, because then after he he starts coming down, okay, from what he's done, he's got his wife laying dead. He thinks she's dead in the bedroom, master bedroom. He has Kimberly laying next to her somewhere on the floor. He's carried her back to her bed, put her in bed. She's she's dead from that head wound. He's got to cover up, okay? What do I do? What do I do? He's kind of panicked, okay? He inflicts a stab wound to himself. He's a doctor. He knows how far to go, what's good, what's not. You know, the, the self-inflicted wound wasn't to his heart, okay? It's over here. Where would you think the wound would be? If somebody is attacking you from the front, okay? It'd be here. Wouldn't he have stab wounds to his hands? Not one. Not one stab wound to his hands. But yet he was blocking all the stab wounds. And his his pajama pot top showed, what, 28, 48 stab holes in it? That's why he says, hey, look, I'm telling the truth. But they weren't torn. If you're stabbing at fabric and you're moving it, it's going to tear. This wasn't. All of those stab wounds through his pajama top was from it being stationary. Okay? Now the prosecution will say that he placed that on top of Colette's chest and stabbed down through it. Possible. Very possible. Maybe even probable. But they definitely was stationary when he put those in there. So his cover up. Now now what's he what's he have to do? His blood was found on a the magazine, not his blood, I'm sorry. It, it was a blood stain, and I apologize, I'm not sure what victim's blood it was. I want to say Colette's. In this Esquire magazine that he has that his coffee table is laying on is an article about the Manson murders that had happened months earlier and how they had written... Pig in blood, Elder Skelter, death to piggies, kill the piggies. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Blonde hair, floppy hat girl saying that. Now, when I heard this, I thought it was asinine that the prosecution would say, after killing his family, he sits down and reads a magazine, right? <laughs> Who does that? I don't think that's what happened. I think what happened was it, it triggered in his mind as a cover-up. Didn't I read somewhere about those Manson murders? I read something. What did they write? What, what did they... That's why he referenced the magazine. He went back to refresh his memory. Oh, piggies, pig, written in blood. Yep. Then he went to the headboard... And wrote pig in Colette's blood with a surgical glove. That's why there was only a piece of it found in there. He probably flushed the other part of it. Not sure. But it doesn't address Colette's blood in Kristen's bedroom. Right? Remember I said there was a significant amount in there. 
I believe Colette was not dead. She regained consciousness and staggered, stumbled to her daughter's bedroom to protect her. While there, he heard this and he went in and he crushed her with a couple more shots of that club. We know this from the amount of blood deposit that is Colette's blood type in that room. Kristen woke up. Now she's awake. She heard this. He carries Colette's body back there or he kills Kristen right then and there. The prosecution will tell you there was significant, there was a time gap. That Kristen was collateral damage. I believe this. I'm just not sold on how quickly he killed Kristen relative to him finishing off Colette in that bedroom. Now, why didn't he let Colette just lay there? I think in his mind, he's still coming up with a story, okay? And that's why he took Colette back to their bedroom on the floor. Now his pajama top fibers are underneath Colette when he takes her back there. All the fibers. Those fibers are from a struggle, folks. A domestic disturbance between the married couple. His fibers are also found in the other bedrooms. Now according to him... His shirt was ripped off. He had his shirt off. It was never a part of him when he went and checked on his kids. So how did his fibers get in there? He goes after Colette is dead. He goes and gets a knife. And he goes in and he ensures death by stabbing them numerous times in the chest and the throat same with uh, Kristen and Kimberly okay the knife he introduces in order to finish them off now why does Kristen have stab wounds in her back she has them in her chest she has them in the back with an ice pick which are not as deep as the ice pick wounds in Colette that would lead you to believe maybe that he's had a cooling off period and she's collateral damage. She had waken up, I believe, during the assaults. She had defensive stab wounds to her hands. Sad. Such a significant parallel to Chris Watts, I believe. But the stab wounds to the back, it could surmise that he didn't want her facing him. And she's easy to control. Just pull her over onto her stomach and stab her in the back. Incredibly callous. Not the work of an intruder, folks. No way, no how. Nope. Am I 100%? Nope. Pretty damn close, though. So. No evidence of an intruder. None. That blonde synthetic hair. Let's talk about that. That's played such a significant role in his innocence. Yet, just like anything, you have experts that Agree to disagree. One expert says that's from a baby doll hair. Yet it's 21 inches long. It's pretty long for baby doll hair, maybe. Other says it's from a wig. And here's the type of wig that it's from. It doesn't take away the totality of everything else that we've ruled out an intruder. How did we rule out an intruder? Because of the weapons coming from inside the house. So I don't care if that blonde wig is, or blonde hair is from a blonde wig. 
That doesn't change the fact. No hippies are going to come in, reach down under the bed, lift up the bed, take out this club, and use it. Not going to happen. If hippies or any intruder come in, they're going to come in with their own weapons. Yet it didn't happen here. And then, not only that, they're going to take those weapons with them, discard them somewhere else, not right outside the back door. Okay? Now we can get into Helena Stokely and Greg Mitchell, who both supposedly had confessed to doing these crimes at various times throughout the years. Both are dead now. Helena Stokely, I would if there's McDonald supporters watching this, which I know there are, and no matter what I say, it's not going to convince you. And I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to tell you the facts as I see them and then give my opinion based off of those facts. And that's what I'm doing here. I watched an interview by Helena Stokely, an uncut interview, where she got all these facts wrong about the case. It is my belief, without a shadow of a doubt, that she was being told what to say by people, including a police officer who had other interests at heart. Now, when I read Fatal Vision many years ago, I believed wholeheartedly in this Helen Stokely character. It's a red herring, folks. It's a red herring. Think of any case... And there's always somebody to say, it was this person. Okay? Even when you have a confession. Chris Watts case. Well, yeah, he might have done it. But his girlfriend was there. She did it. Think about Lacey Peterson case. It wasn't Scott. It was the people that were burglarizing the house next door. Think of a case. <laughs> you know, so you're always going to have that. But when you deduce possibilities to probabilities, you can rule out intruders. The weapons of opportunity, weapons came from inside that house. Those fibers were found in the bedroom where the struggle took place, not in the living room as Jeffrey McDonald said they were. I believe you can start deducing there. And I. I'm confident in saying 100% to that point. Struggle happened in the bedroom. Weapon of opportunity. More than likely, the club introduced by Colette. I won't say 100% that it was because of the bed wedding. I won't say 100% the order that they were killed. Those are all variables that... I don't know, and the evidence don't tell me. But what the evidence does tell me, those fibers, that blood, that Kimberly was killed in that bedroom, she was the source of a problem. And remember, Colette would say to her class that Jeffrey wanted her to go sleep on the couch when someone wet the bed. That is complete flip-flop as to what he said happened on that particular night that he went to go to sleep on the couch because of the bedwetting. The bedwetting was the source. Three o'clock in the morning. You don't get into a regular argument at three o'clock in the morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Something provoked that argument at three o'clock in the morning. Maybe it wasn't the bedwetting. But the evidence there shows me that somebody went to bed. To me, that provoked the argument. Could it have been, for example, he's on the phone with, uh, and I didn't mention, he had numerous affairs, at least 15, that was admitted to. Not by him, but other people. So, I could envision, maybe, he's on the phone 
at 3 o'clock in the morning, talking to one of these girls. Colette wakes up. Could that have been the source of, what the hell are you doing? You know, it, she can't. the witness can't say those were the exact words. However, something like that. Maybe. But there's no evidence of that. The evidence, somebody wet the bed. That is enough, especially if it's Kimberly and not the younger one. That is significant enough to start an argument at 3 in the morning. Are you following me on this? That 3 o'clock in the morning is significant. You just don't argue about somebody not bringing home milk in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning. When one member's already in bed, call that, there has to be a reason for the argument to take place. And for me, the evidence shows the bedwetting. I just went on a tirade there. This case gets me fired up because it really is relatively simple. I want to go over some notes that I wrote watching this documentary. I wrote the parallels to the Watson-Peterson case. This was 1970, okay guys? 1970. Back then, you really couldn't wrap your head around somebody killing their family. It is more prevalent today. You see it. But think back then why nobody could believe that this all-American boy did this. Nobody could believe Chris Watts did it. And again, it goes right back to you never know what people do behind closed doors. You don't. You wear a mask when you're out there in the world. Everything's hunky-dory. We're a great family. Get into your house and your comfort zone. Nobody knows what goes on. Colette's brother, Bob Stevenson, is interviewed. Still choked up over the, the case. I was very impressed with him. Just, uh, I, I, have a, I have written down here, I have a lot of empathy for him. Hero, stepdad, Freddy Kassab, never let the case go. Didn't make sense to him. He's on Jeff McDonald's side the whole time. You know, we're going to find out who did this. They were in conversations. He called Jeff McDonald. Jeff McDonald says, we found the guy, one of the guys that killed Colette and the kids, and I killed him. Untrue, because they had surveillance on him the whole time. Couldn't have happened. And then Jeffrey McDonald even admitted to later lying about that in order to ease Freddie Kassab's pain. He kept trying, Freddie Kassab kept trying to get the Article 32, the trial transcripts. And, and another, you know, McDonald kept coming up with excuses, kept coming up with excuses of why he couldn't get it to him. Remember, it's a totality of everything. I have here Stokely confessed many times. Can't believe her. Can't believe her at all. No evidence of any intruder being there. Okay? I have intruder versus inside, like the Ramseys. We, we've discussed that. 48 holes, ice pick holes, in that top of Jeffrey McDonald's. But yet, he has no wounds to his hands, his wrists, his arms. It would have torn. If it happened like he said it did, that top would have torn. It would have tear holes in it, not little puncture wounds. Dozen top threads from the fibers in the master bedroom, none in the living room. I thought it was pretty... I guess neat is a bad word, but how they preserved that house, that crime scene for nine years. So the jury, nine years later, went and viewed that place and it still had Christmas cards up, drawings of the little girls. I find it ironic, like there was drawings. You could see Kimberly had drawn things misspelled her name on stuff, cute little things that as a dad, you want. 
Yeah, Jeffrey McDonald took like the stereo and the TV. He didn't take any of those drawings. Maybe he didn't want to be reminded, but I found that odd. I have here on Star Watch the Stokely interview. For anybody that is believes Helena Stokely, watch her interview that she gave to a former FBI agent in uh, North Carolina, Fayetteville, North Carolina police detective. The unedited version of that because she gets everything wrong. Nothing matches. You can tell she's making it up. I could tell easily. I have a story by this. So, Errol Morris wrote a book, the Wilderness of Errors, which turned into this TV show, like I said. Joe McGinnis wrote the book Fatal Vision. Now, Joe McGinnis was best friends with Jeffrey McDonald. Throughout all this, they lived together. He got to know him personally. He eventually... He went in thinking he was innocent. But then when he looked at everything, he concluded that he was guilty. And Jeffrey McDonald flipped over this. Flipped out. Felt he was betrayed, this and that. But Earl Morris, who also wrote a book about the case, said this. He says, I have a problem with McGinnis. Because he took something so horribly complex and made it simple. I have a problem with that statement. That's what you do. It doesn't have to be complex. It, you, you make it complex. Okay? By interjecting things that don't matter. Helena, Helena Stokely. <clears throat> oh, this shit don't matter. There's no intruder. It was a domestic violence. It's simple. So I have a problem with that statement. Greg Mitchell, confession in blood, or in, in, in paint. Red paint looked like blood. He supposedly confessed at a boarding house and he wrote, I killed the McDonald family and kids, and then fled. People saw this, but they didn't call the cops. Police went there. They didn't see it. They said it was painted over the people that were there. So there's no evidence of that. Even if there was, I don't believe it. There's no intruders. Stokely. She had written a poem, Helena Stokely. And I read that poem. And it basically, I guess, you know, real poetry doesn't say anything. It just ticks off possibilities. That's what Jim Morrison said. So you can interpret a poem any way you want. And that is the, the crux of poetry. Helena Stokely wrote a poem. And in it, I took from it that she was saying she was an actress being forced lines. That she was being told what to say. Let me see if I've covered everything on this that I want to get through. One of the witnesses, and I'm not sure if I said this, and this goes to my theory that Kimberly wet the bed. Kimberly had told her bus driver in the days previous to this murder that she wished the bus driver was her daddy. And he said, why do you say that? That's not nice. And she said, because my daddy's mean. Is that just something a kid says? I don't. My daughter would never say that. Okay. Is he punishing her for the bedwetting? The hair in Colette's hand. Again, everybody, the defense was saying that that was the intruder's hand. It was Jeff's. He's run out of appeals finally. In like 2019. They're not hearing it anymore. Okay. All these different levels of courts. Systems. Have heard everything. 
and concluded that this guy is guilty, except for one. The initial Army investigation said, I shouldn't say that. The initial investigation still found that he did this. But the headmaster, this, I believe his name was uh, Colonel Rock, said there wasn't enough evidence. And he might have been true. It might be there was, that doesn't, because there's not enough evidence doesn't mean that you're not guilty. Opportunistic weapons, not, it wasn't planned. If this was an intruder, it would be a planned homicide. You don't plan a homicide and not bring any weapons and just hope that you can find weapons in that house, especially a club. No. I have my deductions here. 3 a.m., that's a red flag. Then we went through that. The urine spots, you know, on the bed. The fibers in the blood tell the truth. It's as simple as that, okay? Nothing in that living room. He didn't bleed there. There was no, there was no fight there. All in the bedroom. I have my struggle is why and how the weapons were introduced into the fight. The fight was in the master bedroom over Kimberly went in the bed. It accounts for the club. No defensive wounds on him. The blood on the magazine with pigs. I just I covered all that. <sighs> very intriguing case, but very simple. Really is. If you look at the evidence and don't try to buy in to what the defense tried. Sometimes I will buy in because it makes sense. They have evidence to support it. There's no evidence here of an intruder. It's a simple, I don't know how many times I got to freaking say it. It was a domestic disturbance between husband and wife, child over the child, and it escalated. Simple, folks. It really is. The blood tells you it. The fibers tell you it. The victimology tells you it. He was tired. Had done a 24-hour shift. He wanted to go to bed. Went to get in there. Seen the bed wedding. It was his older daughter, not his younger. Told Colette to go sleep on the couch. Change the bed, whatever it was. She smarted off to him, whatever it was. Maybe he was trying to punish Kimberly right there. Colette didn't agree with it. Something to cause that at 3 o'clock in the morning, and it escalated. And again, the prosecution never, I saw, they never accounted for how that club got introduced. I found it, I struggled with that for a long time. How did that club end up being a weapon like just if you're arguing you don't just bend down pick up the foot of the bed and pull out the club and use it you just don't you, that wouldn't be done but I think he pushed her shoved her and it knocked that bed off of that club and then when he punched her and she fell to the floor she saw it and she picked it up to use it against him I don't know if she was really going to hit him with it, but, you know, to protect herself. But I think she did hit him with it. And that accounts for that. And he's got a, a fingernail scraping across his chest. That's not an intruder. That's indicative of a fight between a husband and wife. And he took that club from her. You know? Who do you think you are? You want to try to hit me with the club? You did hit me with the club? Escalates. Blind Rage. That should have been the title of the book. Not Fatal Vision. That's it, guys. An hour and 20 minutes in. Sorry, I had a lot to talk about. And I know I probably missed something. But that's what the crime scene photos told me. And I looked at the crime scene photos. Okay? I could have very easily put them on here, but I don't do that. But I've seen the crime scene photos of those little girls and of his wife, okay? 
no doubt they got into a fight, physical fight in that bedroom. And it ended with him killing his family. Believe it or not, I'm telling you that's what happened. So this was, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad this one got done. You know, I always wondered. So I'm glad we did this and went into this deep dive on this. No doubt he did this. And he's where he deserves to be. So, uh, anything else I want to cover? Memberships. Hey, if you're not a member, member, become a member. Live chats every Wednesday for members. We can talk about this case more or any other case that you got. Right now, we are the fastest growing true crime channel on YouTube. Okay? And I love it. Just growing. Growing what it's all about if, if you're uh, if you're not you're not growing you're dying so thank you guys I appreciate all the support and for all the ones that don't support me move on you know the good outweigh the bad the positive outweighs the negative without a doubt and my members are so supportive and I just I'm blown away by you guys. I really am. I always knew that, you know, I had fans that they would send me letters to the DA's office and Facebook messages all the time after the History Show, History Show channel. Um, and I just got into talks again with another network day before yesterday about another television show. But I, I made up my mind. I'm not going to do another show unless it's done my way and it's my own show. So... We'll see if it gets worked out or not, but that's just the way it's going to be because you reach, everybody's been there. You've reached a certain age where you do what you want to do, and I've reached that age. I'm not going to do what I don't want to do. I love doing these assessments uh, for you guys, and I love teaching you, and I love that you learn from it, and I get satisfaction from that. So as long as we can continue to do that, you know, let's do these live chats for members every Wednesday. And I'll keep doing these and we'll talk about them, okay? All right. Um, Joan Jett and the Runaways. Hey, if you never heard them, I know you have. My rock and roller's out there. And uh, Joan Jett, you know, in the world of Kim Kardashians, please be a Joan Jett. <laughs> With those words, mains out. Oh, yes.